book of Esther. Father, thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. Thank you for the freedom of this hour. Thank you for the blessing of knowing you and being known by you. And Father God, Son, and Holy Spirit, we just declare our love for you, our dependence upon you. And again, Father, we pray that by your Spirit, you will open our eyes and our hearts and our minds, that we would invite your truth into our life, that we would be equipped by it. And then in this week that is ahead of us, we would live for the glory of God. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, according to the dictionary, a Pyreic victory... A Pyrrhic victory is a victory won at too great a cost to have been worthwhile for the victor. Now, I have to tell you, I'd never heard of that idea of a Pyrrhic victory until in 1978, after Nebraska beat OU in that great game, our beloved leader and coach, Dr. Tom, said, we just won a Pyrrhic victory. And little did we know that he had already been informed that we were going to get to turn around and play OU again in the Orange Bowl a short time later, and he referred to that victory that day as simply being a Pyreic victory, knowing that the joys of that victory would soon fade as we faced the OU team again in the Orange Bowl. Well, a Pyreic victory can feel at times more like a loss than it can a win. When we come to Esther chapter 2, as we do this morning, as you first read through this chapter, it almost seems to me, it almost feels to me like we're reading about a Pyreic victory, a victory that comes maybe at too great an expense to the victor, except in this chapter and in the unfolding of this story and in this book, it's not a Pyreic victory because, in fact, we have the privilege of seeing behind the events this unseen hand of the providence of God, and God does the things that only he can do in the ways that only he can. So as we come to this chapter this morning, here's what we want to see. We need to embrace the gospel every day of our lives. We need to embrace the gospel every day so that we can resist the urge to just fit in with the world. And then if we do, in fact, stumble along the way, having embraced that gospel, we will know the way back. And we will find our way back, even having experienced a momentary setback. As we think about embracing the gospel, here's what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that every day we recognize that apart from God and apart from Christ, we can't do anything. That every one of us needs every day the grace of God in our life. That's what it means to embrace the gospel. It means that we need to cast ourselves on God every day so that he can sustain us and carry us and do the works in our life that only he can. Let's review very quickly chapter 1 that we looked at last week, and there are three things that stand out in my mind as we think back on that chapter. The first one is in that opening chapter, you have the world's values. You have the world's values. I mean, talk about putting it in your face, front and center, right there they are. All the things that the world holds dear, all the things that the world pursues, whether it's pleasure or power, whether it's wealth, whether it's the abundance of extravagance that we see in this opening chapter, everything is there, and it's not there just in small measure, it's there in excess. So it's really a snapshot, it's really a picture of the way our world views life and the things that it strives for. Secondly, we talked about the fact that as we go through this book, there are times when we're going to need to be smiling at the satire that is a part of this story. Because as the human author recounts these details for us, He doesn't mind interjecting some things that make us smile as we read about what's going on. For instance, here we have a picture of the most powerful man in the world. The most powerful king in the world is presented to us in the first chapter. He is the king and uh, sovereign over 127 provinces, but who's counting, right? The writer of the letter told us it's 127 provinces that King Xerxes Ahasuerus is given charge of. And yet his own wife, while he may be king of the sovereign world as it is known in that day, he's not even king of his own castle. His own wife tells him to take a hike. And so what does a guy do when that happens? Well, here's what we're going to do. The third thing is we're going to reject the unbiblical view of women that dominates so much of the world then, even as it does today. You know, whether it's politics in the fifth century in Persia, as exemplified in this man Xerxes' life, 
or whether it's any number of people in our world today in the 21st century, whether it's politicians or professional athletes or whoever it might be, as we're seeing the news dominated by so much of this stuff, we want to take the opportunity, guys, and specifically guys, we want to take the opportunity to model before the world what it is and how it is that God says we're to treat women. The Judeo-Christian heritage brings into the equation something that no other worldview brings in, and it brings in an elevated and high view of women. And so we're going to read through this story again today, and we're going to reject the thinking of the world. We're going to reject a worldview that says women are just things, that women are to be objectified, women are there for the pleasure of men. And we're going to stand against that, and we're going to say, God, how is it that you want, in contrast to what we see here, how is it that you want us as godly men to not only love our wives, but to lead our families? How can we put that on display? How can we show that? You know, last Sunday, uh, I talked a little bit about uh, this idea of uh, uh, insecurity on the part of men, <laughs> male insecurity. And I said two things happen. I said uh, one of the things that happens is they don't want to admit they're wrong, right? That's male insecurity. I said the other thing that happens is the fact that when, when they uh, don't get respect, they demand it. When they don't earn it, they demand it. Well, I forgot that there's a cartoon that says, uh, I'm a professional. Uh, don't try this interpretation at home, all right? You see that cartoon? Is that up there for you? It's not up there? Oh, we're going we're gonna to miss out on that cartoon. It's a cartoon of a guy, and he's standing in the pulpit, and he's basically saying, I'm a professional. Don't try these interpretations at home. Well, what happened was some of you didn't hear that I was stepping into the world of satire, all right? I was joining in with the parody of this particular author, and when I did that, I said, here are some things that men should do, not, right? So some of you guys took that and went home with it, and I got some of that information back from your wives. So I'd like to ask the following men to stay after this morning for some remedial... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Rather than doing that, let's do this. Let's put before us, guys, 10 ways that we can, in fact, as godly men, love and lead in our homes. Are you ready? Now, here's the deal. You're not going to try to write all these down. They're available in the foyer, and guys, I'm sure your wife will get one uh, if you don't. But if, if we run out, we'll put some more out there, all right? Here they are. Here's, here's 10 things that go against the thinking of the world. And the number, uh, number 10... You see the spiritual nourishment of your wife as your primary duty. Number nine, you love just one wife. You're faithful to that woman that God has brought into your life. Number eight, you pursue Christ in a vibrant way. So your spiritual pursuit is of primary importance. Number seven, you think first about your wife, not yourself. Number six, you hold the baby, take care of the kids so your wife can eat first. How about that one? That's a good one. You take the lead in apologizing. So rather than the stance that we see out of Xerxes is he won't apologize, he doesn't do wrong, you take the lead in that. Number four, you show the strength wherever you can. Number three, you take the hit to protect your family. Number two, you solicit wisdom from others, namely your wife. How about that? And number one, you die daily to yourself. So when you look at that first chapter and you see here's the values of the world, here, in fact, is God saying to us, you know what, with all of the things that they think they have going, with all of their power, with all of their pursuits, God sits in the heavens, the psalmist says in the second chapter, and he laughs because he knows the real power and the real source of blessing comes from him. And as we do that, guys, we want to be out in front and we want to show the world what godly, Christ-like leadership looks like in our lives and in our home. Well, let's look this morning at this second chapter. It's a study in contrast, as we're going to see on more than one occasion as we go through the book of Esther. And it starts off with the powerful and debauched court. That's where we begin in verse 1, and it begins with regret. It begins with regret on the part of Xerxes. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. So you begin verse 1 with three kind of interesting words, after these things, and you say, after what things? That's right. 
Most Bible teachers, most scholars, most historians think that between chapter 1 and chapter 2, we have something incredibly significant happen to Xerxes and to the kingdom of Persia. We mentioned last week that he had his eye on Greece. And most historians think that between the account of chapter 1 and chapter 2, Xerxes mounted what was probably at that point in time in history the largest military campaign ever assembled, and he went against Greece. And Greece kicked his tail, his army and his navy were defeated, and home he came. And so when we come to chapter 2, this is the setting, this is the context. And he gets back home, and this period of time that has unfolded between these chapters and between this storyline, he not only is licking his wounds from his army, having been humiliated, he comes home and he remembers that he doesn't have a wife to console him anymore. Vashti isn't there. And so we open this second chapter in this first verse, and here is Ahasuerus. He's depressed, and he has no one to minister to him, no one to console him. And you notice the word remembered. The word remembered there can connote something of a sense of loss, can kind of speak to the fact of someone having some compassion as they remember and think about something. But I like the way the, the Holy Spirit gives us this language because, again, it just reflects this man and his, his mindset and his worldview. Notice at the end of that first verse, he's, he's remembering what she had done and what had been decreed against her. It's almost like he's looking at it and going, you know... Why did she ever do something like that? You know, it, kind of looking at her as, as putting the onus on her and, and this decree. I mean, I, I wonder where this decree came from that, that uh, caused her to be banished in the way that she was. And it, it's almost like you read that verse and he's sitting outside of the circumstance, not taking ownership of it at all, but looking at it and, and kind of continuing in his sense of self-pity. Well, the smartest men in the room, as we're not surprised they would do, jump into action again, right? So we notice in the next part of this uh, chapter, the second verse, the smartest men in the room take charge again, and they change the focus. When you have a depressed and lonely and slightly angry king, that's a bad combination of stuff, especially when he doesn't mind lopping off the heads of people. Because in verse 2, then the king's attendants, these same guys that we saw last week, right? Then the king's attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. The cure for loneliness, the cure for unhappiness offered in 5th century Persia is strikingly similar to what is offered in 21st century America. I mean, you read that verse and you talk about a distortion and you talk about a degradation, and, and you talk about a worldview that looks at women totally contrary to what we just said, and take something of what God intended in the sexual relationship to be something sacred and intimate and special between a man and a woman within the context of marriage, and we're given a snapshot into the way the world sees people in verse 2. We've got a lonely king. We've got a depressed king. We've got an unhappy king. We know what to do. Let's meet him at his basis level of needs. Let, let, let's, let's fool him into thinking that somehow we have something that's going to temper all of that sense of loss in his life. And let's bring into his life some beautiful young ladies who can attend to his every need. And so what you have in this story as it unfolds in this chapter causes us to, on one hand, kind of want to just jump right over into chapter 3 because this is going to be kind of a sordid business that unfolds before us in this second chapter. But God has it here for a purpose. God's intent is for us to learn through this. So let's uh, come to these verses and see then in verses 3 and 4, the contest begins. This is not a contest that uh, might remind us of the TV show The Bachelor for whoever has ever watched that show, uh, which is probably about half of us. Uh, not, I didn't mean us, I mean you. <laughs> I, I, no, sir, I have never watched The Bachelor. I can honestly say with God as my witness, I have not watched that show. This isn't Miss America, okay? We don't want to be confused about what's going on here. That's not what's happening. In verses 3 and 4, we read this, Then let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces. So 127 overseers are going to be appointed. 
in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to Susa the capital, to the harem, into the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the women, and let their cosmetics be given them. Now, one historian says this was hundreds of young ladies. Another says it was well over a thousand. We don't know the number there. Verse 4, then let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Vashti, and the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. You look back at verse 2, and we know that the girls that were to be chosen, the qualifications there were threefold. Didn't have anything to do with character, didn't have anything to do with their worldview, didn't have anything to do with anything beautiful on the inside. It had simply to do with those three things that are mentioned in verse 3. They need to be young. So most likely in this culture at this time, these are going to be teenagers at, 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 at best and maybe very early in their 20s. Uh, they're going to be unmarried and they're going to be beautiful. Those are the qualifications that are put forward. You need not apply because the government's going to find you. That's the task that has been given to these provincial leaders who are going to go about this business of finding these ladies. And when they find you, life is going to change forever. I, I suppose on a certain level, there had to be a, a, an appeal to, to some young ladies when this word went out that this was going to happen. I mean, life in the palace, right? Life with everything that you could ever imagine uh, given to you just at your uh, beck and call. But make no mistake, life changes forever for these young ladies. Because what awaited them was, in fact, uh, simply a life at which they were at the disposal of a rather depraved man so that he could realize whatever sexual pleasures he desired. That's the life that they would be consigned to. They would not be allowed to have a family of their own. They would not be allowed to marry. They would not be allowed, in many cases, to ever even rejoin their family. They might, in fact, spend one night with this man and then be forgotten forever. To become a part of the harem of this king, to be a concubine, was on one level, I'm sure, somewhat attractive to a certain element, to a certain mindset. But the reality is that this life that they were chosen for was a life to inevitably be discarded and forgotten. And their life would change from that point forward. It is a sad and a very degrading picture that unfolds for us here. And I would say, again, it's one that we're far too familiar with in our culture, in our day. Because as I look at this, and especially guys, I look at this, and any guy that's here this morning, and you find yourself uh, looking at pornography, and you find yourself hitting on sites on the internet that display imagery and video and pictures or whatever else is out there, which is almost anything and everything, then you and, and I, in fact, as we enter into that world, become modern-day Xerxes. You know, I mean, we, we can look at this chapter and be appalled all we want, but the reality is that every man who steps into that arena steps into this arena with Xerxes. And, and it is, takes us right back to where we started, this, this idea of having a biblical Christ-like view of women, a, a view of women that God elevates far beyond uh, the, the capacity of meeting any physical desire that a man might have. And so this is the picture that I want us to see. We are, in fact, acting out the very life that this man chose, the course of his life, because those ladies that are depicted in those videos and films and movies, it's not just pornography, it's going to movies that are just totally inappropriate where you see the same thing. Viewing the nakedness of a woman who's not your wife is sin, it's wrong, and it should be repented of, period. It's not a display of, of fashion, it's not a display of art, it's not in any way, in my mind, depicting a storyline. It's stepping over a line that God never intended for us to step over. And, and those ladies are somebody's daughters, they're somebody's sisters, in some cases they're somebody's wife, and we have no right to enter into that arena. And so that's what's happening here, and if that's where we find ourselves, guys, then we need to cry out to God for repentance, and we need to cry out to each other for help. 
because there's a way out of that. I can assure you, many have found that. There is a picture in those opening verses then of this powerful, debauched lifestyle within the court of Xerxes. The contrast is when we come to this powerless covenant family that we're introduced to in verses 5 through 8. We're going to be introduced, first of all, to a man named Mordecai. And Mordecai appears to us in verses 5 and 6, so let's read those verses. Now, there was a Jew in Susa, the capital whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem from the captives who had been exiled from Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. Now, this is what we know about Mordecai. We know, first of all, that his name is of a Babylonian origin. His name comes from the god Marduk, which was, of course, a Babylonian god, the sun god. He is described for us as being a Jewish man. And of his lineage, we're told that he's of the tribe of Benjamin, he's of the line of Kish, that would put him in a noble line. He's in the line of Saul. So that's kind of significant that here we have one within this exiled community who can actually trace his lineage back to the first king. We know that his family was exiled over 100 years before these events. And so it's very likely that he is a third, maybe even a fourth generation exile. But for sure, he's got to be a third generation exile. So his family has been living in Babylon and in Persia for 100 years. We're going to learn more about this later, but he's also a magistrate. So he is in something of a place of influence. And he's living in Susa by choice, which we'll come back to again. Here's the other things that we know about him, and that introduces us to the second person in the story, which is Esther. And what we know as we come to the introduction to Esther for the first time is that in the book of Esther, Mordecai is going to appear 52 times, and Esther's going to appear 55 times. So now we've been introduced to this point in the story to two of the leading figures in this story that's going to unfold. We'll we'll meet another one uh, next Sunday, Lord willing. What we know about Esther is this. Esther's name is Persian. Her name is taken from the goddess of the sun, Ishtar. So Esther means star, but her name is of Persian origin. The other name that she is given is her Jewish name, Hudusa, which means fragrance. Thirdly, we know she was orphaned. We don't know when she was orphaned. We don't know what those circumstances were. But somewhere in the family that had been exiled, which would be her family, her mom and her dad, uh, both died or were killed. The other thing that we know, which is of import to this story, is she's a strikingly beautiful young lady. In fact, we could literally translate that statement that speaks of her beauty as saying that she is, in fact, beautiful in form, and it says lovely to look at. There's only one other person in the Bible, only one other woman that this is said of, and that is Rachel. When Jacob was seeking a wife, it was said of Rachel that she too was beautiful in form and lovely to look at. So we look at this account, and and notice, if you will, uh, verse 7, Mordecai was bringing up Hadusa, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, For she had neither father nor mother. Now the young lady was beautiful of form and face. And when her father or mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Verse 8 says, So it came about when the command and decree of the king were heard and many young ladies were gathered to Susa, the capital, into the custody of Haggai, that Esther was taken to the king's palace into the custody of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. So now again, we are at a place in the story where I personally have a lot more questions than we get answers to because now we've been introduced to Mordecai we've been introduced to Esther we know the the contest that is underway we know that the supervisors of this contest are seeking the most beautiful young women in all of the kingdom and so when we read that eighth verse a lot of questions again come to mind as to what's going on we knew when we read verse seven When it described Esther in the way that it did, we knew, before we even get to the unfolding of the story, we know ahead of time Esther is going to be chosen. She is described in a way that is unique 
in all of the Bibles to, to, for God to say, this is a strikingly beautiful young lady. We know that as the story unfolds, she's going to be picked. She doesn't have to apply. She's not entering into a contest. She's going to be chosen. What we don't know is whether she went willingly or whether she was forced. When it says in that 8th verse that they were taken, uh, or rather verse 6, who had, uh, no, not that, no, I'm sorry, it is, it, it is in that 8th uh, verse. They are taken off into the king's palace. That word taken does not by itself mean something that was forced upon somebody. It doesn't have to require us to look at that and go, this is something unpleasant. It, does, it simply doesn't tell us. It says she was taken. So she could have gone willingly or she could have been forced. What about Mordecai? What is his part in this whole thing? Does he protest? Does he seek to protect her? Is he in some way proud of her because she is so beautiful? Because she is selected? Because she has such a small number of young ladies that have been chosen for this position possibly? What's going on in Mordecai's mind as all of this unfolds? And if you're a father this morning, and especially if you're a father of a daughter, all you have to do is step into this circumstance. All you have to do is step for a moment into this and say, what would I have done? What would have been going through my mind when I hear the decree that every beautiful young lady that falls into this description and qualifies in the way that is outlined, what, what am I thinking about my daughter? Am I thinking of where, where can I hide her? Where, where can we run to? How can I possibly allow her to be taken? What can I do to protest against what's happening? Do I have any recourse at all? And so those things are part of the unanswered story that unfolds before us here. But here's what I want us to see. While we have a lot of unanswered questions, as I read this account and read it and see some things that were told and then some things that are specifically missing, I want to suggest to you thirdly that what we have going on here is assimilation all the way. Now what's happening at this point in the story, and I hinted at this when we first began our study a couple of weeks ago, is that this is assimilation all the way. Because the primary question that confronts us at this point in the story is simply this. Was Esther always a godly woman, exemplary and above reproach, as this story unfolds before us? We know that Xerxes is not a good guy, right? We know that his wise counselors are not good people. We haven't met him yet, but we know Haman is not a good guy. But what we don't know is where are Mordecai and Esther at this point in the story, as this unfolds, where are they, if you will, in their walk with God? It seems to me that what you say about one, you can say about the other. So we're just gonna lump them together. And it looks to me like we have three choices that as we approach this part of the story, we can take the view that says that Esther was always a godly lady, that, that there's never a point in this story where we're to infer or read into or, or, or wonder about that at all. And there are many commentaries and many Bible teachers who take this approach. And frankly, if you pull those off the shelf and you go to the second chapter and to verses 16, 17, 18, a lot of them, they just run right by those verses. They don't even comment on her night with the king. And it's almost as if they never even happened. But you can't help but as you read this story, realize that this is a significant part of what's going on in the life of this young lady. So we can take that approach. The second one we can take is simply to say Esther didn't have any choice anyway. And we can look at this, and we need to be careful here because obviously we have even circumstances in our day where there is sexual trafficking and, 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 and the slave trade that goes on behind the scenes in the underbelly of our culture, and it is obviously a despicable thing. But we, so we need to be careful here, but, but we could ask the question, who could stand up to a Persian king? Who could possibly stand up to a Persian king? We, we, why are we at the story that we're at? We already know the answer. Who could stand up to a Persian king? Vashti did. Vashti said, King, forget it. I'm not coming. You've, you've sent me a command and a decree, and uh, you lop off my head if you must, but I'm not coming. I'm not fulfilling your desire that night when that command came to her. 
So we have an example of somebody who simply said no, don't we? And said no to the king, putting everything at risk. The third possibility, it seems to me, is Esther is to be understood in this story as a woman growing in her devotion to God. She is growing, if you will, to be a a fully devoted follower of the Lord. And what I would want to do as we go forward is I'm going to suggest that this third choice is the track that we should be on. That we don't have enough evidence to say Esther is to be viewed as a godly woman and as a godly example and as a Daniel, if you will, or a Joseph to us at this point in the story. Now, does she exemplify great courage later on? Absolutely, she does. Does she step out in faith? Absolutely, she does. Is she to be admired for that? Absolutely, she is. So this isn't in any way to to demonize Esther. This is, I think, the word of God being real to us and the Bible being honest with us and saying, here is a person whom God greatly used, but maybe at this point in their life, they weren't where God is wanted them necessarily to be. I want to support that with four things. So as we think about that third possibility, I I would suggest four reasons why we land there. First, and we covered this briefly in our first introduction, uh, they're living in Susa. The very fact that Mordecai and Esther are living in Susa, God had commanded and called his people to go back to Jerusalem 50 years before. So 50 years prior to this, almost 50,000 Jews obeyed God and went back home. Those that did not go home did not go home because they liked what they had. Their homes were built, they had jobs, they had a certain measure of of, uh, uh, comfort in that home, and they were going to go back to a desolate place, and they simply said, no, we're not going back there. And God had told them to go back. So they're here, they're they're living in a, a culture in which the snapshot of Scripture is such that God gives us a book of his people living at that time in a setting in which God is never mentioned, as we said. Prayer is never mentioned. The covenant is never mentioned. Sacrifices are never mentioned. There's no reference to the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. There's nothing that would say to us there's been anything but assimilation that's happened. And I think that's part of this picture of these exiles living in this culture. They've been assimilated into the culture rather than standing out from. Secondly, Mordecai's instructions to Esther. What are those instructions? His instructions to Esther two times, in verse 10 and again in verse 20. Notice what what verse 10 says. Esther did not make known her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Now, I don't know what's behind that, but you could read that and and you could understand that to say, Esther, do not mess up this opportunity. You are where you are. Don't blow this. There is something here for you to be pursuing. Why does he make this point? Why does the writer of Scripture make this point two different times? Don't tell anybody who you are. What's going on there? There's one thing going on. To hide your nationality as a Jew is to, in fact, hide your faith. That's what's happening. Don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. Why not? Because then they will know that you're a follower of Jehovah. So it's the hiding of her faith. They're not living, in other words, as the covenant people of God. In fact, they're living indistinguishable lives from the rest of the culture. Here's what Isaiah said before they went into exile. Listen to what Isaiah said of these people before God ever took them off to Babylon and then to Persia. Isaiah 5, 12, and their banquets are accompanied by lyre and harp, by tambourine and flute, and by wine, but they do not pay attention to the deeds of the Lord, nor do they consider the work of his hands. Therefore, my people go into exile for their lack of knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude is parched with thirst. You see, before God's people were even carried off into exile, they had assimilated into the culture. And when these Jews got to Babylon and when they got to Persia, they just furthered that assimilation. And they had, if anything, a private faith. But it was not a public demonstration. And, you know, we're told today that as Christians, oh, you can have your private faith. 
Just don't bring it into the public arena. You know, just, just keep it there in your home, in your heart. Don't, don't, don't bring it out into the public square. And my friends, that's just simply not possible. We cannot, as the people of God, simply have a private faith. We're called to fly our flag. Everybody that we encounter, if God gives us the opportunity, there should be a flying of that flag so that they understand that, no, we aren't assimilated into this culture. No, we are different. No, we do live differently. No, we see this world differently. But these, at this point, I think are at best what we might today call cultural Christians. And we've got a slew of them out there, don't we? We've got millions of people who check the Christian box on any form that they fill out. But there's nobody that knows by looking at their life that there's anything distinguishable about them at all. They're so totally conformed to this world. You can't be salt and light and at the same time be assimilated into the world that you live in. Third thing, Esther doesn't just survive in this setting. She thrives. She doesn't just survive. She thrives. She's following the rules of the competition. She's doing everything that she can possibly do to prepare herself for the opportunity. Clearly, as you read these verses, she's not sitting around and moping. She's not depressed in that sense. She's not withdrawn herself because we read that she wins the favor of Haggai. All right? She wins the favor of Haggai by how it is that she's conducting herself amongst all of these other chosen ladies. So she is putting forth effort to be noticed. She's not just fitting in, she's doing more than fitting in. She's putting herself forward as someone who would be deserving of this opportunity. And that's a part of what is given to us here. Daniel, remember in the first chapter in the ninth verse, refused the table of the king. And you know what it says? It says that Daniel won favor. It, it, it says that God gave that to him. God granted him that favor. So God granted the favor to, to Daniel. Esther won favor before Haggai. And then lastly, Esther wins the contest following her one night audition with the king. That's rather blunt, but that's the reality of what these verses say to us. Look verse 16. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus. After a year of all of this uh, preparation, Esther was taken to King Hasuerus to his royal palace in the 10th month, which is in the month of Tebeth, in the year of his reign. Did you notice that we're four years after chapter 1, verse 1? These events have been going on for four years. And the king loved Esther more than all of the women, and she found favor and kindness with him more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king gave a royal banquet and Esther's, uh, Esther's banquet for all the princes and his servants. He also made a holiday for the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. The most difficult part of the story is right there in those verses. Esther, in this initial reading, seems to have won a Pyreic victory, a victory that comes at a cost that maybe is too high for the victor. But into that Pyreic victory, I would suggest to you, steps the unseen hand of the providence of God. And God rescues that victory that may have been at great cost. Because here is a Jewish young virgin, a Jewish young lady, who steps across a boundary line, engages herself not just sexually, which would have been against the, the law of God, obviously, but even doing so with a Gentile, which would have been an even greater violation of God's purpose and will. And I want to suggest to you that as we look at these two contrasting pictures, that we have a God who uses both of those. And so let's end this morning with this in mind. Let's take away from this second chapter that we have God using both a powerful king and a powerless young lady. And, and the first point would be that God cannot be thwarted by the evil acts of men. I mean, there, there is nothing to commend us. There is nothing about Xerxes that, that, that can be commended. I, I mean, he is a man who lived life at the, at the basis level of life. And this picture that we have here, uh, if we dwell on it for very long, is not a picture uh, that is anything other than just a sordid picture 
of the baser side of a man's life. And, and what God does in that circumstance is even in the palace of an ungodly king, God is at work. And it ought to be of great encouragement to know that even today, the hand of God is able to move into any place that he desires to go, uh, and, and he does and accomplishes his will, and it cannot be thwarted, right? That is the work of God. And then lastly, secondly, our God can use his children even in spite of their failures. And if that first point encourages you, and I hope that it does, to realize that God takes on by his providence even the evil deeds of people and uses them and turns them for his glory, so much more should we be encouraged by the fact that our God takes even us as his children and in the midst of our failures and our shortcomings, God does not write us out of future blessing. And I take great comfort in that that the failures we may encounter in our walk with God do not circumvent God from using us and blessing us in the future. doesn't undo the choices that we've made. We don't get to push rewind and redo and go back and have all of the choices unraveled and all of the consequences undone. We don't get to do that. We live with those for the glory of God. But the remarkable thing is then God takes those very things, even those failures, God takes and he uses them in remarkable ways and unexpected ways in our lives. And my friends, that's what we call the grace of God. And that is why we end as we begin. We embrace the gospel of God in our life every day. After all, what is this book if it is not a story of the lives of broken people who fail God at many different points along the way? whether it's Abraham, the chosen man to bring into very existence the, the nation of Israel, who would on two different occasions offer his wife to another man to avoid his own safety being jeopardized, or Jacob the schemer, or Noah ending his life in drunkenness, or Gideon calling for people to worship him at the end of his life, or David, the greatest king in Israel's history, we can recount story after story after story, can't we? In which God just pulls back the veil and says, listen, I take you as you are. And by my grace, I bring out of your brokenness and out of your failures, I bring something unexpected and I bring something remarkable. And so we, we, we stand in the grace of God, don't we? We embrace the grace of God every day. And it's only then that we can resist the world. And even as we stumble along the way, it is only then that we find our way back. And I hope you know that grace this morning. I hope you've encountered that grace multiple times this morning. I hope that if you need to embrace that grace again this morning, you will do so before this morning ends and that you will welcome again into your life the grace, grace and mercy of God. And if you have never done that in a personal way, then we would invite you this morning to realize that Jesus Christ, God's Son, came to this earth. He died on the cross and he did it as a payment for sin. And he did it so that I could have this relationship with God. He did it so that I could enjoy the blessings of this gracious and good God in my life every day. And we receive that by faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you so very much for the indications in Scripture that you take us just as we are and you do something amazing in our lives. We thank you for your grace that comes to us every day. And Father, I pray for each one of us. I pray especially right now for somebody this morning who needs to embrace your grace in a very specific way for a very specific cause and reason in their life. Lord, that they will do so, that they will turn away from sin and they will turn to you and find that in you there is forgiveness and in you there is healing. In you, the one who takes us as broken as we are, and you begin to mend and bring us to a place where you want us to be. So, Father, I pray that your spirit will work mightily, encourage us by your word, and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.